down. Hello? When you're running late for work. Or he will put you on the phone with somebody from across the ocean that you can barely understand. After you've been on hold for 37 minutes, listening to the same fingernails on a blackboard uh, kind of hold music. Or you had to work through their bot. I have no idea why everybody in the world thinks they want themselves a bot. Because most of the ones that I encounter, either on a website or on a phone, makes me more frustrated than I was before I called for help. And I'll explain to the person when they answer the phone is the purpose of your bot is to help me, not to have me so frustrated that when you come on the phone that I'm ready to rip your head off. Okay. Anyway. We understand that our world is hewing for themselves broken cisterns. The people that Jeremiah is addressing are people, listen to me, beloved, nobody woke up one morning and you said, you know what, you know what would just be an amazing idea? For us to be complete pagans by sundown. For us to completely turn our back on God by sundown. To stop doing the things that God tells us to do. Nobody ever wakes up with that notion on their heart. What had happened is just slowly, step by step, day by day, they had drifted so far away from God and His Word they never even noticed. Until they woke up one morning and they're complete pagans. Oh, they still had God's name on on their lips. I mean, they would go to to the synagogue or they'd go to the temple for the, the special festivals. Listen, beloved, how many of us, July the 4th, will just be a, a good reason to go, I don't know, what they put on sale, go buy a new car? Or to have hot dogs and hamburgers instead of thanking God? Why do we call those days holidays? Because they were originally designed to be holy days. John Quincy Adams believed that when Uh, a future generation celebrated the 4th of July that it would be not on the lake but in the church thanking God for the gift of the political freedom that this nation uh, grants to us and here we are I mean here we are a scant what 240 years away from our revolution and we're not even teaching our children how to read cursive writing so that they can read the Constitution. Broken cisterns, beloved. God says that there is an alternative to that. In verse 19, God says, know and see. Listen to me, beloved. How many, how many of y'all have ever done something in your life and it went so spectacularly wrong that you will never, ever do that again? Okay. When Angie and I, we hadn't been married very long. We still lived in Newport. And it was her birthday. And so I was making her a birthday cake. And we had this mixer. I don't know where we bought it, but the electric cord wouldn't stay in the, in the mixer. And so I've got the mixer, and I'm mixing up the cake batter. She was still at school. She didn't know I was doing this, thankfully. And so I'm mixing up the cake, and the, and the power cord fell off that mixer into the cake batter. Without even thinking, I reached down and grabbed that power cord and stuck it into my mouth to get the, to get the, the batter off of the power cord. Well, I've got a silver cap right back here. I got it right about here, and that bad boy arced toward that cap. <laughs> got my attention just about knocked me out and then I started talking to myself have you ever done that you idiot you why in the world did you do that listen to me I will never again stick a power cord in my mouth all right whether it's on or not it ain't going in my mouth and what God calls us to do is to look back listen to me beloved so many of us never ever want to think about the sin that we've committed well Jesus died for those sins 
But we need to look back and understand the pain that that sin brought into our lives and say, God, thank you for teaching me this lesson. God, would you use me in the life of somebody else that's struggling with the same thing to teach them to rely on you? This notion of living waters is not just something that that we see as a one and done. In John 4, verses 10 through 14, Jesus says this, He answered and said to her, this is the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you what kind of water? Living water. She said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle. Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. You know, just kind of as an aside, this is the way some people read the Bible. I was reading a a critic of the Bible uh, a few weeks ago and and, and obviously we know that, that right after this, a revival broke out in this little town. And they're saying, the Bible uh, nowhere says that the apostles proclaimed the gospel to anybody in that town. You're absolutely correct. But it does say she did. It does say she went back to town. And she had a testimony. Everybody knew who she was. Everybody knew she'd been married five times. Five times. Five times. You know, I, I'm just going to go out on a limb here. If, if you've been divorced five times, the problem may not be with whoever you uh, keep uh, picking. The problem may be you. Everybody knew who she was. And she went into town and said, I met this man who knew everything I have ever done and yet he still loved me. That's living water, beloved. They could see the living water flowing through this woman's soul. Later, in chapter 7, verses 37 through 39, Jesus says, Oh, we don't have that one? All right, I'll read it then. It says, now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Revelation 7, 17, it tells us this, For the Lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Listen, beloved, we preach this this text at a funeral a lot because it has a great promise for us that God is going to wipe every tear from our eyes. But listen, beloved, we're missing the springs of living water that God is talking about, that He's going to guide us to these springs of living water. And in Revelation twenty two seventeen, 17, it tells us, The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. Isaiah 12, verses 3 and 4, Isaiah says, Therefore you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. And in that day you will say, Give thanks to the Lord. Call on His name. Make known His deeds among the peoples. Make them remember that His name is exalted. And in Isaiah 55, verses 1 and 2, it tells us, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Do you understand, beloved? This is not a passing uh, topic in Scripture. God repeatedly invites us to the living water that only He can give. Verses 14 through 16.
We've all seen movies where it's just a retelling, basically, of the, of the prodigal in Luke 15. Where the child leaves home for one reason or another. They find themselves in trouble, and even though their family could easily help them through that trouble, they have severed their relationship with their family and, and no longer have the protection that they might need. That's what we're looking at here. Israel had gone on so long without the presence of God in their lives and without even noticing it. Not even noticing that God was no longer in their lives. That they're now in complete apostasy and they don't recognize it. They were alienated from God. And they no longer had the presence and protection of God when they were oppressed or attacked by other nations. Now, one thing we know is this is before Emperor Nico from Egypt came and attacked Israel. Because Josiah is still alive. And Josiah was killed in the attack by Emperor Nico. Do you see what's happening? Even godly Josiah is going to lose the protection and the presence of God in his own life. Early in the chapter, chapter 2, verse 3, God promised that he would defend an obedient Israel. Now, through Jeremiah, God asked his people to consider the case of Israel in the sense of the conquered northern kingdom to remember why they were now slaves. Verses 17 through 19. The reason for their oppression is clearly stated by God. You know, we have a document that every employee and every student in our district has to sign. They don't have to read it, but they do have to sign it. And most of them never read it. Some places call it an AUP, an acceptable use policy. We call ours an RUP, a responsible use policy. Okay? And we outline for them very specifically, these are the things you can and cannot do inside this network or with equipment that belongs to the Greenville City Schools. By and large, most people adhere to it, but we have some that don't. And we have that document that we can point them back to, and they can't say, well, I didn't know it was wrong to look for pornography on the network. Well, number one, common sense should have told you that one, but we've got it right here. Well, I never read that. Well, that doesn't matter. You did sign it. And God is doing the same thing with the Israelites here. He knows that he's going to send the Babylonians against them to conquer them and to take them into exile. And he doesn't want them going into exile going, God is unfair. God did not protect us. God is a liar. Or God doesn't exist. Because a lot of them are going to feel like God has turned his back on them, and he has. But he wants them to know that it was they who had forsaken him, not he who had forsaken them. And so what they are doing, listen to me, beloved, they are playing the game of power politics. They're saying, you know what, the Egyptians have got a good strong army and the Assyrians have got a good strong army. They'll be able to protect us against the Babylonians. They will, but there's always a price to pay. And there was a price to pay for that. They aren't to rely on treaties to guarantee their safety. When the people were refusing to believe God, no alliance or earthly power could protect them from the penalty of sin and the hand of God's judgment. Verse 17 is is poignant. Have you not done this to yourself? Have you not done this to yourself? 
Listen, beloved, we can't blame anybody but ourselves for the sin problem. The opening pages of Scripture, we see Adam trying to blame Eve and Eve trying to blame the serpent. And God will have no part of it. He basically says to them, Have you not done this to yourself by forsaking the Lord? We can never blame someone else for our own sin. Beloved, why is our nation, our world, in the sorry state that it's in? Because our nation, our world, has forsaken God. Europe is now a post-Christian continent. Asia is a mix of godless religions, as is Africa. Australia still has a large body of believers, but they are struggling. Central and South America have a large concentration of missionary activity, but they are up against the worldliness that is being sold to them by the United States through our movies and our television uh, programs and our sporting events. North America, the United States and Canada, we seem to have just given up. It's not important anymore. We're very close to being a post-Christian culture. And some uh, commentators and sociologists believe that we're already a a post-Christian culture. The Israelites and the people of our world have one great need. They needed to consider their wicked ways and the bitter consequences of forsaking the Lord and failing to fear Him. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear Him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And can I tell you something, beloved? We're not talking about Satan here. We're not talking about what Satan can make you do. We're talking about God because we have forsaken him. Look at verse 19. Your own wickedness will correct you, and your apostasies will reprove you. If Jerusalem did continue on their destructive course, there would be more than enough correction and rebuke found in the consequences of their actions. Throughout Scripture, God is depicted as a river of living water, refreshing, rushing, bringing cleansing and healing and fruit. Jesus spoke of the rivers of living water flowing from our life when the Spirit of God is ruling. Everybody in this room knows those times. We know those times when the river of life has been flowing in our lives. We've experienced that already, that inner sense of gladness and joy that God is present in our lives. But to forsake that, to turn from it, and to be satisfied with a lot of cheap things, Why would anyone do that? How many of y'all have ever seen the ads either on the internet where you get this amazing smartwatch for $39? And they say it does everything that that the Apple Watch or the Google Watch does. Can I tell you a secret? You are not going to get a watch that does what an Apple Watch or a Google Watch does for $39, okay? You are not going to find something like that at Big Lots, okay? I like Big Lots, but you're not going to find something like that at Big Lots, And yet in our spiritual life, listen, we're looking for a big lots kind of Christianity. We're looking for a cheap substitute, something that will get our thrill uh, going, make us feel better about ourselves, and then go out the door forsaking what God wants to do in our lives. Why would anyone do that? Listen, beloved. It is because they lose their sense of the worth of God of the greatness of his being. Why was Aaron building an altar at the foot of the mountain where Moses is receiving the commandments from God? Because Aaron and the people had lost sight of the grandness and the glory of God, of his majesty, of his supremacy, of his greatness, of his ability to lead, of his ability to fill us with joy. 
God is the wellspring of joy of living. To turn from that to all of the other kinds of things that we can get involved with is just drinking from a broken cistern when God wants to give to us living water. God says that in that last verse, your own wickedness will correct you. Ever been there? Ever been there driving down the road, 20 over the speed limit, and the blue lights come on behind you? That's your own wickedness correcting you. Amen? That's your own wickedness correcting you. And so, beloved, God says that your own wickedness will correct you. The word correct means to chastise with blows or with words. And we've all been there. In Luke, I don't even know what I wrote there. Uh, Did he figure out what, did you? Okay, he figured it out. It's the Magnificat in Luke 1, beginning of verse 4. Mary is celebrating after Gabriel has announced to her that she's going to carry the Messiah. For the mighty one has done great things for me. And holy is his name. Now listen, beloved, just a few minutes ago, Mary is asking, how can this be? How can this be? She was questioning the greatness and the glory of God. And now she is saying, the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who are humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Listen, our Catholic friends want to teach you that Mary lived this perfect sinless life that she was conceived without original sin. There is a church in Israel that is the church of St. Anne. Angie and I have seen it. Guess who St. Anne is? It's Mary's mother. And they believe that St. Anne was conceived without original sin. Well, listen to me, beloved. You can't stop there. If that's going to be your theology, then you're going to have to go back and pick up Anne's mother. And you're going to have to come back and pick up the mother uh, before that, and the mother before that, and the mother before that. But you've got one major problem. Sooner or later, you're going to get back to Eve, and the whole thing falls apart right there. Mary was a young woman that probably was doing better than everybody else, if you want to grade on a curve. But at the beginning of this, she had no understanding that God would possibly move in her life. And it's not, listen, it's not just because of humility. Who am I that you would choose me? It was because she was aware of the sin in her own life. And she's amazed that God would use her to show the world His majesty and His power and His glory. And she concludes her song by saying that God's mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear Him. God calls us to understand that our sin problem is our own fault. Listen, why did I fail almost every accounting class I took in in college? Because I didn't study for it, okay? Because I didn't study for it. It's not the professor's fault for giving a hard test. It's not Angie's fault because we were out on a date. It's because I chose not to study. It was my problem. And the sin in my life is no one else's fault. It is my fault. I did it to myself. We've all been in that place, and we may be in that place right now where our sin is correcting and reproving us. In Romans 6, 3, Paul tells us this. The wages of sin is death. And aren't you glad God didn't put a period there? He goes on to say, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying? We behaved ourselves into the front part of that. The wages of sin is death. We did that to ourselves. We did it freely and, and with our own choice. But God gives to us a free gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Romans 5, 8, Paul tells us this. 
God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. See, so many churches will teach you that you've got to get your life cleaned up and then you've got to come to Jesus. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. While you were yet in the midst of your sin, while you were yet dead in your sins and your trespasses, Jesus Christ came to you. He quickened you back to life. Know and see that He is the stream of living water. Israel is in the very midst of her sin, and yet God reaches out to them, begging them to repent. Oh, beloved, we are in the very midst of our sin, and God is begging us to repent. Will we know and see what our sin is doing in our lives and turn to Jesus, the living water? to cleanse us from our sin and make us a child of God? Or will we be chastised and corrected by our own wickedness? Will we this morning know and see the mercy of Almighty God?